Thanks, everyone, as you're getting settled in again. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Professor Stuart Russell, who will give brief remarks about a special project that he has been working on. We're really delighted to feature uh, his work. I'm impressed always with the faculty members and thought leaders here at Citrus that they're not only developing new technology, really pushing the frontiers of what is technically possible, but then also reflecting on what the implications of that technology might be. Uh, and I really uh, respect and regard Stuart's work on this and trying to rally scientists actually around the world to think more deeply about the purposes that some of the technology is being put to and how we might anticipate that and, and build in um, securities to, to make sure that it's put to good purpose instead of ill. So let me introduce Professor Stuart Russell. Thank you, Camille. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a letter that we wrote a few months ago um, about the subject of autonomous weapons. Uh, so first of all, let me give you a quick definition. These are weapons that locate, select, and eliminate human targets without human intervention. Um, this is not science fiction. Uh, they've been around for a long time. Some of them uh, locate and select in very, very simple ways. For example, landmines uh, locate and select targets, but they're not very smart about it. Uh, so they kill tens of thousands of children, uh, and as a result, they have been banned, uh, except by the US. Uh, the Samsung Sentry robot, which is in use in the demilitarized zone in uh, Korea, uh, there it is. Anything within about two miles uh, that moves in that area that looks like a human being can be killed automatically. Uh, the Israeli Harrop missile, uh, which is launched and can loiter for several hours uh, and is given a target description. Usually it's uh, anti-aircraft radar, uh, but can be other things, for example, tanks, trucks, and so on, uh, and it will then dive in and destroy those targets. Uh, and our letter basically says we need a treaty uh, to control and uh, limit this kind of development. So uh, in 2012, the United States, to its credit, actually issued a policy saying that fully autonomous weapons uh, would not be developed and deployed by the US. And there is a, a moratorium uh, and a requirement that every attack on humans requires appropriate levels of human judgment. That's a somewhat slippery phrase. Uh, and some interpret it to mean human judgment in the design of weapons, uh, which is not quite the idea. Um, in 2013, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur Christoph Heinz issued a report uh, saying that these weapons were imminent and could present very grave threats to uh, human rights and international humanitarian law, which governs uh, warfare through the Geneva Conventions. Uh, in 2013, the campaign to stop killer robots was started, a very lurid title, uh, but very um, serious. Uh, people, Human Rights Watch, the Red Cross, and other organizations are participating in that campaign. Uh, the UN actually began discussions on a potential treaty in 2014 in Geneva uh, in, uh, as part of the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons. Um, and I actually addressed the UN uh, this April uh, to talk about AI and its implications. Um, part of the public relations uh, involved in this campaign was helped along by a statement from DARPA that they wanted to build weapons that would hunt in packs like wolves. Um, obviously, that guy didn't go to the public relations training day. Uh, uh, in uh, just a, a week later, we had a debate at AAAI, uh, and the goal is actually to, to bring the professional associations uh, to the point where they can actually adopt a policy on this question, uh, bringing them, I would say, kicking and screaming. Um, and in late 2015, uh, we, sorry, late July, we published this open letter um, from AI and robotics researchers. It has almost 3,000 signatories from 50 countries, uh, 11 presidents of the major international organizations in the field uh, and from large companies and another 17,000 other people, uh, including like Steve Wozniak, Elon Musk, Stephen Hawking, and so on. Um, so normally at this point, I would show you a list of, of the press coverage that we got as a result. Uh, unfortunately, that list would occupy the rest of the day. Uh, so Human Rights Watch, uh, some poor intern at, at HRW, uh, counted 1,812 newspaper articles published as a result of this open letter uh, just in August. 
Um, so let me just uh, go through some of the basic points about what led us to this position. So first of all, autonomy is not something magic. A lot of people think that autonomy means human level AI or something like that. No, uh, chess programs already have autonomy. You, a human tells the machine to win. Uh, the machine sees the chess position, does some reasoning, comes up with a decision. And in a qualitative sense, there's no real distinction between that uh, and doing it in warfare. Okay, chess is just warfare in miniature. It's more, warfare is more difficult, but autonomy is the same question. There's nothing magical about it. Um, and uh, very serious people, such as the UK Ministry of Defense, say that uh, autonomy in many military scenarios is already feasible. Um, and if we wanted to, I think within about uh, two years, we could, uh, with a Manhattan-style project, produce some very, very serious and dangerous autonomous weapons that could be mass-produced. Um, and uh, there are a number of component technologies. I'm not going to go through all of these, uh, but all of these pieces are in place, and it's mostly a matter of system integration uh, and manufacturing technology and miniaturization. Um, but let me just give you a couple of examples. Some of you may have seen this. So low-level motor control, both for ground vehicles and air vehicles, is really uh, pretty much a solved problem, as you can see from this video from Boston Dynamics. Um, we also navigate show you environments some, with obstacles. Uh, aerial vehicles. This is your front door or your window in your living room. And here are some lethal drones coming into your house just to see who's inside. Um, target recognition is very important. And uh, it's already the case that uh, the component skills, so uh, recognizing categories of objects such as human beings, uh, recognizing individuals, uh, tracking moving objects uh, are all uh, basically solve problems as far as military technology is concerned. Um, one of the difficulties pointed out by the UN is that this is not the problem if you want to be uh, compliant with international law. You have to recognize not a human being or a soldier, but an active combatant, which is not a visual category. It depends on the circumstances, the behavior, uh, for example, whether or not a, a surrender has already taken place and so on. Uh, you also have to recognize whether the attack is militarily necessary, uh, and you have to recognize whether the collateral damage would be proportional to the value of the military objective. And these things are very difficult for AI systems currently. Um, but I think besides the humanitarian concerns, the strategic considerations are much more significant. So if an arms race takes place, um, then essentially human beings will be defenseless. We can't compete with robots in terms of uh, speed, agility, reflexes, accuracy, and so on. Um, even micro UAVs, systems that weigh you know, on the order of an ounce, uh, like the ones we just saw, uh, can kill a human being either by shooting you through the eyeballs uh, with tiny little bullets, um, or by con direct contact. So one gram of shaped charge is enough to blow a hole in one centimeter of steel and certainly in your head. So very, very small robots can kill quite large human beings. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, within a few years, you could be producing these kinds of lethal systems for about $25, $50. Uh, uh, someone who has just money can buy a truckload of these, a million of them, uh, and wipe out a city or a large army. Um, so they have scalability in the sense that we computer scientists like, um, that uh, just a very few people uh, can take on uh, a very large human population. Um, and that's not a good thing. Uh, international stability, such as it is, uh, has relied on the fact that if you want to do serious damage, you need a country to do it. Um, and uh, hopefully the process of uh, getting a country behind you and having the infrastructure and personnel to do that damage uh, places some constraints on what people do. Uh, but without the requirement for large popular support or economic infrastructure, uh, the stability becomes much less. Um, so these systems would empower dictators, non-state actors, terrorists, uh, and they would tip the balance of power away from civilized nations. Uh, if you think further ahead and look to the situation where, uh, as a result of an arms race, nations are using uh, very large numbers of autonomous weapons in their defense uh, positions, um, then you have additional problems. Um, up to now, the balance of power has been uh, based on economic strength and on the sort of physical technology, which changes on a decade kind of time scale. Um, but with autonomous weapons, it's the AI itself that controls 
uh, whether or not your systems win or lose in battle. Uh, and that can change in days. If you come up with slightly improved software, you can upload it to your entire uh, defense posture, uh, and then you've changed the balance of power. Uh, you could also, by hacking, discover uh, the enemy's software and then uh, make, their, make their military systems completely vulnerable to defeat. Um, you can have things like the flash crash that took place in the stock market, except in a military context, where systems start to uh, behave in unexpected ways, and the whole thing spirals out of control. Um, it's also the case that, um, as a, a simple fact of game theory, uh, systems that are uh, in conflict need to adapt. Otherwise, they become predictable and therefore they lose. So adaptation is a military requirement for these systems, which means it becomes very hard to predict them, uh, how they behave, uh, and to control what they end up doing. So in summary, uh, these weapons are a new scalable class of uh, weapons of mass destruction, that are really ideally designed for terrorists and dictators to use, and uh, they reduce the stability of the military balance. Uh, so I will mention one of the 1,812 newspaper articles uh, that came out, uh, which is the Financial Times, a very sober publication. Uh, their main editorial on August 8th said that this is a nightmare the world has no cause to invent. Uh, unfortunately, it's pretty much already been invented, uh, but we need, to do, we need to do something to uh, prevent its proliferation. Thank you. So I have a, a couple of minutes for questions if people would like to ask. Maybe just uh, one question if we, I know this is a rich topic, we could probably go on for an hour or more uh, in a really exciting discussion, but I wonder if um, there might be one. I have an easy question. <laughs> What's next? This is a frightening uh, view of the future, and uh, this is an important view. So what do we do? Uh, so I think at the moment, the negotiations are finely balanced. Uh, the US, the UK, and Israel are the technological leaders, uh, and they also have very significant diplomatic power uh, in the UN. At the moment, they're saying that, you know, we're serious, we have internal review procedures, don't worry. Uh, and they're not pushing for a treaty. Um, so our next step is to basically go top down and get, uh, get the US to change the negotiating stance in Geneva, and I think that will have a dramatic a impact. Problem, the main problem is the terrorists and the dictatorship that you showed in Yeah, so I think there's a difference between homemade weapons and mass-produced weapons. Okay. Uh, you know, the, the, the truckload of a million micro UAVs, uh, those can only exist if there are you know, advanced high-tech manufacturing facilities churning them out in very large numbers. I think just, you know, taking pizza drones and sticking machine guns on them, I mean, yes, it will probably increase, uh, increase the scope for mass murder um, by terrorists, but not to the scale where it changes strategic balance or, or creates a, a nuclear weapon-style threat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart.